Go. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan and everyone at Books and Books, I am thrilled to welcome you to the Dam Team, um, a virtual event with Renee Adia to discuss her enchanting new book, The Damned, the follow-up to the beautiful in which Sebastien Saint-Germain and Celine find themselves embroiled in a high stakes um, in high stakes as a consequence of their love, which threatens war among the immortals and possible revelations Celine may not be prepared to face. Both mysterious and luscious, the creatures of the dark and characters of a multicultural 19th century New Orleans find their fate at the mercy, mercy of memory and friction in the damned. In addition to the beautiful series, Renee is the number one New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of The Wrath and the Dawn and The Flame and the Mist book. She lives in Charlotte, North Carolina with her husband, baby, and their small presiding dog. In conversation with her tonight is Roshni Chokshi, who is the New York Times bestselling author of the Stark Touched Queen duology, The Gilded Wolves, and Arusha and the End of Time, the latter of which was recently optioned for film by Paramount Pictures. Drawing on world mythology and folklore, her work has been nominated for the Locust and Nebula Awards and has frequently appeared on Best of Year lists. Remember that tonight, throughout the broadcast, you're invited to ask questions at the button below that says, ask a question. Uh, after Roshni and Renee dis have their discussion, we'll have a Q&A session and ask those questions. You can also find Renee and Roshni's books for purchase at Books and Books at the green button below. And every purchase that you make helps Books and Books, a locally owned independent bookstore, continue to celebrate great stories and storytellers like those we have tonight. So without further ado, Renee and Roshni. Am I here? Hi! <laughs> uh, I love your face. It's a great face. I love your face. <laughs> I've missed your face. Even though we talk via chat all the time, I've missed your face. I've missed your face. I really have. Um, but I'm super excited to get to chat with you about The Damned. Which, first of all, even when you told me about the title, I was like, oh shit, this is gonna be great. <laughs> this is gonna be amazing. Um, and I wanted to dive in, like, first of all, with just, like, how do you, how do you feel in having, like, the second book in this incredible, what is it now? Is it a trilogy or how many books are you gonna have in this? So I'm not supposed to say yet how many books it is, uh, but uh, I think it's, it's uh, I've already had, which is, like, kind of amazing to me. The book came out yesterday. I already had some people messaging, like, uh, "What, what are you doing at the end of the book?" And I think it's pretty clear there is something that will be happening after uh, the dam. I don't want to get too much into it because it might be a little bit spoilery. But um, yeah, yeah, this is my first longer series. I've done uh, two duologies prior to this, and it's been super fun to get to make such a a, a rich world and continue expanding upon it. It's one of the things I love about my favorite fantasy series, something you do incredibly well too. Uh, with the beautiful, uh, it was it mostly taking place in New Orleans. Um, and so that got to be uh, a setting that was a character of its own within the book because I'm a huge fan of New Orleans. It's one of my favorite places in the world. Um, and just to build a paranormal a world within New Orleans and based on New Orleans was such a treat. And now with the dams, we're sort of expanding out beyond that, going into a space, an other world space, which was really fun to write. Uh, and I have not been able to do that yet because my other books were still kind of grounded in, in a reality we would understand, even though they were fantasy. So um, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a lot, but, Let's let's begin with you know how the hell are you pandemic everything what's going on oh that what <laughs> pandemic I didn't even start with that I'm like what is, where are we these days um, it's fine yeah it's not fine <laughs> but it's not fine it's it's not fine. hello <laughs> like, yeah I have tea <laughs> spilled spill the damn tea but yeah. well, cheers cheers cheers, cheers. Uh, cheers. 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 we will here what are you drinking? What am I drinking? Mm -hmm. I am drinking an aviation that I did not make because my husband is what much better. Aviation? What is an aviation? I want to know. So, but, so I can make him make it for me too. Y'all, I'm, I'm such a mean big sister. Such a mean big sister. You're a terrible big sister, but I love you. Um, so it's got it's got Luxardo in it. Uh, it's got 
Hendrix gin, but this time we used a Hendrix Orbium, which is their limited edition. It's got some Lotus something in there, potentially some Sprite wings, a horn of a fairy, etc., and creme de violet. Ooh. And Ooh. So it's delicious. And I thought it was like perfect for this book, especially. It's something that I would try to order immediately at Jacques, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, would, it would fit in very well, the New Orleans, I will say. That's, it would. That's, it would. It's like you're, you're drinking like enchanted water, like darkly enchanted water. Darkly enchanted water. Yeah. I love it. Don't drink <laughs> it. Um, but I, you know, I do want to talk about, like it's those details that you add into your world building, the food, the atmosphere and like the tiny things that there was something that caught my eye, especially when I was reading the damned, you mentioned, um, Romeo spikes and it's an element of architecture in new Orleans and it blew my mind. I was wondering mm -hmm. if you don't mind sharing with our audience here, like what are Romeo spikes and did you come across any other little, I don't know, strange details about world building that you were Absolutely. Excited to create? Absolutely. Well, well, the great thing about new Orleans is it, it's sort of got this like dark, seething undercurrent of sexiness and mystery and magic. Um, and it's sinister in, in the best of ways. Uh, it's got this really sort of like haunted past to deservedly so. It was a major port city in slave trade. Um, and the things that uh, make New Orleans unique unto itself, it's largely shaped by these sort of very darker points in its history. Um, it's been a majority minority city for a very long time. It's got this wonderful amalgamation of culture um, that's, and, and what's happened here is you have a New Orleans way of speaking, a New Orleans way of dressing, eating, living. I mean, they have this, uh, it, it's, it's, they say, you know, let the good times roll nowadays, you know, like that's a yeah. phrase that epitomizes uh, New Orleans. And I, I don't know, the world building for me was, it, it was, almost easy because I was able to world build it based on something I loved very, very passionately. And the people and the music and the cuisine of New Orleans, um, it's inspiring at every turn. So uh, especially the history of it, it's so, yeah. um, because it's rich and layered and I like that a lot in any book that I'm reading and therefore I endeavor to put it in any book that I'm writing. I love that. And I also just realized I didn't even return the question of how are you, mostly because I feel like I stock every aspect of your life that I can. And I'm just hoping <laughs> that you do. So how is the world as you dive into your own world? You get messages of my son. We've, we've uh, a, little, a little guy, um, and he was born at the end of March. He's a pandemic baby. Uh, 10 out of 10 do not recommend planning a pregnancy during the pandemic. Just putting that out there for everyone. <laughs> Actually, the pregnancy part is probably about having a baby wouldn't do it again if I was <laughs> like oh. it's, um, it's he is a gem it's just that you know we can't, we can't go anywhere you were so afraid with the baby you can't go anywhere and at the very beginning of this I didn't want to put any of my family members at risk either mm -hmm. um, a lot of our parents are high risk um, so it was a lot to have a baby because you, you, you kind of think especially where I'm coming from my mom is Korean um, the idea of babies and children being raised by community is very much, I mean, it's the same way with like the, with your culture, Rosh. Yeah, absolutely. Like, absolutely. yeah, like it, it, that, that's where everybody descends. Everybody sends friends, family, they're, they're there to help. They're there to offer advice. And for a large swaths of the early part of, of our son's life, it was just me and Victor. And Victor is my husband. And um, this was a wonderful task. I know I married the right man because we're both alive still. So, yeah. <laughs> um, that's wonderful. He's the best. Your baby is the absolute best. Um, yeah, when Renee like FaceTimed me for the first time so I could see him, she had to wait until after we were done with the panel because she knew that I'm a mess. And the minute I laid eyes on him, I just started bawling. My husband like ran out. Are you okay? Like it's just so beautiful. And I just have so many feelings. <laughs> When I told Rashi I was pregnant months ago, like that's the first thing she did too. I was like, oh, well, it's a good thing I didn't do this like where everybody else is there. It, it was it's so cute. It was I so just cute. cry because I just am really happy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I can't wait for him to meet you. I can't wait for him to meet you. I know. I can't wait to meet him. I'm just gonna spoil him so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering, you know, like it's it's so interesting when we talk about 
quarantine, how how we're doing, mm -hmm. and especially writing fantasy. I mean, you're just a master at creating worlds that are so believable because of like the details that do the heavy lifting, the emotion there. Is that? And I know the world building you said was a little it was easy for you in a way to mm -hmm. slip into because you love it. Mm -hmm. uh, is that still true for you, like writing during quarantine? You know, it's funny, like, the, and I, I think the, I think we might have talked about this a little while too, um, like a little while back. Mm -hmm. I think everybody's having a little bit of a struggle right now just because there's not a lot of space for letting your mind wander. And I, yeah. I think that's the case whether or not you have, you know, a small child who's using you as a 24 seven Denny's. Um, so like, like you, there's not a lot of space for that. And I think that that is, it's appropriate for what's going on. And there's a lot of reality around this, but then I also think it's important to make it like it's necessary for us to take a step back from this. So yeah. when I am able to sit down and I am able to ground myself in uh, a different world and transport myself, whether it be via writing or reading, I'm trying to do a lot of reading right now because that's helping me a lot. It does take a little bit longer. I don't know if that's been the case for you. It takes a, a little longer. It, I think it's because I don't feel the freedom to completely let myself go and be oh, yeah. into this. Like, there's just, uh, but I, I, I would make the argument that no time, at no time is it more necessary than now for us to be reading and writing and sharing books that we love. And it books like your books and books like my books, those are the things that I want to read right now because, uh, especially with what you do, it's so utterly transformative. You're a wonderful world builder too. Like what you did with um, <laughs> wolves and the upcoming Silver Serpents. Uh, like like it's it's just amazing because you can totally feel immersed in it. You're slipping into a character's shoes, listening to them laugh, you know, feel it, feeling the kiss of rain on their cheek. Um, it's, it's, that's what I need right now. I think it's, I would argue, I think it's what a lot of us need, so. Which is a sign to those who are listening that if you need to escape, if you need to go somewhere else, <laughs> in other people's shoes, uh, you really need to get yourself the beautiful and the damned. Which oh, is thank you. Truly. I, I also, I, I have to interject too because I'm I'm, I'm a, a lucky chick who got to read an early version of The Silver Serpent. I, I tell Rashi this with every single one of her books. It's frightening because she gets better with every book. And with every book, she is one of these authors that I am so proud to see constantly push to challenge herself. To yeah. No, to outdo herself. Yeah. Um, already the books that she's writing are fantastic, and she's pushing herself to do better. It's frightening, and it's wonderful. So. You want not to do that when people are watching. So I can't hide. I can't go anywhere. <laughs> I just, no one yeah. can go. Now tell me where you got your necklace. No, no. I asked her before. She will not tell no. me because it was a sale on Outnet. <laughs> <laughs> I watched it. There was this <laughs> there was this one influencer on Instagram who was like, "Chunky gold necklaces are the thing for summer," and I was like, "Wow, chunky gold necklaces are the thing for summer." So then I bought ten. <laughs> and I wore yeah, yeah. I, I'm going on order from Missima. Have you seen Missima? Maybe you're totally. Oh missing. yeah. No, I'm. The story is just like. So, yeah, oh god. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's so um, good. But I'll take that too. The, the no, no, you're not. Renee steals my stuff. It's but, a lie. No, it's not fair because she's an older sister and she is pretty much my older sister. I I don't get to steal as many things, but she cooks for me, so that's better. Mm -hmm. That is that's nice. I'll steal things. Also, Nonsense. The mm -hmm. other plus side of being a little sister to Renee is that I get to hang out with her characters first. Ha ha. <laughs> um, and what you did to these characters in The Damned is so diabolical and so good, but it also is so mean you're a bad person. How do you sleep at night? <laughs> uh, well, I have a three and a half month old. I don't sleep. You don't sleep. Yeah, I don't sleep at night. I devise evil ways to hurt my characters and books because it brings me joy. <laughs> One of my favorite things um, that you did, though, especially with Bastian's journey, because he's, first of all, just so beautiful and so damn, so tortured. I love him. Um, one thing that he talks about is this was what it means to be a good man, both supernatural and otherwise. And I really wanted to know what made you want to write a male character who, who's on that different kind of journey. It's not a journey that I've seen a lot. 
thank you so much for, for making that point. It was actually early on, it was my exact intention to do that with this book because I wanted to have more books, especially for young adult readers um, that explored what it meant to be a good man and from a modern lens because I think a lot of the books, I love to read historical romance and I love reading about you know so-called alpha males but if you think about that through the, the lens of modernity, you, you realize that a lot of the characteristics of alpha males are, are grounded in toxic masculinity. And yeah. um, I, I, I think it's really important because, you know, we're, we're, we're adult-ish at this point in our lives. And we can sort of differentiate, you know, what's, what's fun to read in reality. But with, um, I have teenage nieces. I really want them to push back on the concept of what it means to be a good man. It's not just somebody who provides the, the, that hunter provider mentality yeah. um there needs to be depth there needs to be introspection there needs to be free expression of emotions and growth and what i really wanted to do with bastion's character in the dam sorry for the spoiler right? but if you've read the the uh the blurb you realize this, the the damned is a book about bastion he has now become a vampire and uh he's really struggling with this transition he's really really struggling because it's not what, what he wanted to feel like the loss of his humanity means that he no longer deserves anything good in his life. And his life is uh, potentially never ending. So that's a, that's a long time to not have anything that makes you happy and not have anything that you treasure or cherish. And that includes the love of the human girl, seeing that he and Matt in the first book, the beautiful. And I, I don't know, I think that with the beautiful, I drafted that during the uh, Kavanaugh confirmation hearings. And I was like, I mean, you and I talked about this too, just like the undercurrent of rage that we had. Most women that I spoke to were just mm -hmm. that entire time. And that really heavily shaped the beautiful. But then it also made me think to myself, I really want to make the damn about what it means to be a good man because uh, Dash's uncle, Nicodemus, he wants him to be the good man that's shaped by toxic masculinity. Somebody who the only emotion they're allowed to freely show is rage, who's, yeah. who's never allowed to be wrong, who is controlling and territorial. Um, all of these characteristics that uh, actually don't make for healthy relationships. Yeah. Uh, whether they're manifesting in a, in a woman or a man or mm -hmm. um, somebody that's chosen not to have a gender. These characteristics are not healthy. Uh, yeah. but freely expressed in men and they're celebrated in men. So dismantling that was a big part of this book. Well, and kind of a lot of, like, I feel like too, what I kind of want to do with this book because it, it's about questioning the way we've been taught to think about people and what we need to do. I, I think at the end of this, before we open it up for questions, we should do a, like a lightning round. This is like the fill the damn tea, tea yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. And I think the lightning round, we just ask each other questions, almost like truth or truth kind of thing. And oh. ask this. God, fine. I'll yeah. make <laughs> note of it at the 6 30 ish mark. I feel like I know you a lot of questions I would ask you, but not everybody else does, so it's fun. <laughs> I hate when you do that to me. Um, here I was, I was going to compliment you. I was going to be like, wow, Renee, like, it's so good that you put this on the spot because I feel like so many of us are, are having these difficult conversations and, about how to stand up. For ourselves, the things that we believe in, um, even within our own friend group. So I feel like that just adds to the great timing of this book and the sort of struggles that these characters are going through. And my heart really just went out for Celine. I mean, you are so rude, <laughs> like it's so mean. and and really playing with what it looks like to I, I don't know different versions of strength, which I think is something that you do so well with all of your female characters from Shazi and the Wrath and the Dam to Marco and the Flame and the Mist. And now we get Celine. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering like, is what was your favorite part about writing her journey in the Damned? Well, I think for me, Celine's journey is interesting because it's sort of becoming reacquainted with somebody she, uh, she kind of found in the first book because she's given up her memories. Yeah. Uh, in exchange for Bastion's life at the end of the beautiful. And uh, she's given up her memories of their time together. And she's also coming to trust with a part of herself that she's never really understood. And that to me was really cathartic to write because uh, it, there's, there's obviously a very 
pocket. There's a metaphor there because my, Celine is half Asian. I'm half Asian. And, half white. Yeah. and um, that struggle with identity that I feel is universal. Aaron, yeah. of your background, there's a unique struggle with people who are half of one thing and not enough of another. Like that's really what it comes to. Absolutely. You're, um, you're mixed race too. So yeah. it's, it's like you're never going to be Indian enough. You're never going to be a Filipina enough. No. And it's that question of what you are and who you are. It, 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 it's a it's a difficult one to overcome, and I can imagine it would be even more difficult in 19th century New Orleans. Absolutely. And so, uh, Absolutely. so she was coming to terms with that, but there's another element of it as well that she's starting to realize uh, is now a part of her truth, and that she, things are not as simple as they seem on the surface. I love that journey, as you can tell by my like strange <laughs> dancing. <laughs> Um, so now to some fun questions. Who is your favorite character and why is it Arjun Desai? <laughs> <laughs> I, I really, I really love Arjun. Arjun is a fun character, right? Um, and he, there, there are elements in his humor, especially that were largely inspired by one of our dearest friends from college who lives in uh, Mumbai. And uh, the, the, the snideness, if, he, if he's watching or if, he, if he's read this book, he absolutely will realize, wait a minute, there's a snide part, part of this character that I think might be because of me, and I'll be like, absolutely, it's because of you. So, I love him. Yeah. I just love him. <laughs> I love him, I love him, I love him. And he's also like my favorite kind of, I don't know, romantic hero. And so that kind of made me want to ask you next, like, what is your favorite romantic trope? Because you've played with so many over the course of your fabulous books, so tell me. Um, well, I'm really getting to explore a lot of my favorite romantic tropes with this series, which is really, really fun. Um, right now, the book that's coming after The Damned, I'm exploring two things that uh, I didn't think I would get to write for a YA audience, and I'm super excited about it. Um, two things that I love in romance books. Uh, one is Marriage of Convenience, and the other is there's only one bed in the room. So <laughs> I'm very, very excited to write this. Uh, I'm so excited. Especially with the two characters that uh, I'm working with in this book. And um, I, I don't want to be too spoilery, but I think you're going to be happy. Rob. I know I'm going to be happy. When <laughs> <laughs> like, start writing, you let us like, can I have it yet? Can I have it now? Can I have it now? Um, I I love those tropes. I especially I think that you do a great job of flipping them on their head. I sometimes do it where. Like I, I just did this Audible novella and it was fun and it's not really much of a spoiler, but there is a one bed trope, but it's because the one bed is like a, like a demonic bed that's out to eat them. And that delighted me. <laughs> that's, that's a very you thing to do. That's a that's very you thing. <laughs> me and you both really like Byronic heroes too. I've noticed that. I'm a, I'm a, we really like Byronic heroes. And there's so many layers of uh, issue there too, because I'm never going to get away from my love of Byronic heroes. But again, yeah. It's the, it's, the, it's the prime example of toxic masculinity. This tortured soul who never wants to tell you what he's thinking or feeling and probably will fall down the rabbit hole of noble idiot at some time in the future. And um, that's something I hate. Uh, like, I don't do the Byronic hero who falls down the noble idiot. Like, like I'm like, or the one where if somebody just told them, like, clarified one element of a conversation, this entire problem is gone, and you're just like, ugh. ugh. <laughs> Please, like, come on, just talk. Man. The root of your like sexy torturedness can't be miscommunication. It's not exactly. Hard. It just means you're exactly. it means you're a bad listener. Wow, this it means you're a bad listener. <laughs> I, I, think, I actually think the uh, way to do this properly is what you have done with Silver Service. Because oh. there there is no, there is a secret there, a very important secret that would yes. make huge difference to the unraveling of uh, two characters. Actually, not two characters, almost, almost everybody. And you do it well in a way that I'm not exasperated, where I'm like, look, this is, I, I was sitting about with this is dumb. Somebody please just tell this person what's happening. <laughs> well, I, you know, that's my favorite thing about romance and um, historical romance, and it's something that you do so well. You excel at making them say the thing out loud, where you're like, I can't believe that just happened. Is that is anyone in the room with me? It it made me feel and you know like we both loved uh, Holly Black's Cool Prince trilogy. Yeah, yeah, and there were yeah. elements of that where you're like, oh, they just said everything out loud. Yeah. Wait, what are they going to do next? Um, and to me, like that's just the mark of of being an exceptional storyteller. That you are not 
lazy at all with pulling the way that we communicate or the way that a character relates to someone else. That's what I'm talking well, I really appreciate that, especially because in the beautiful, um, like, uh, we, this is a good segue for the, one of the questions I wanted to ask you. Oh, God. All right, God. I'll just, I want everybody to hear your story. Um, no. <laughs> uh, in the beautiful, whenever Celine tells Master that she's attracted to him, that's basically what I did with my husband. So, that, like, Celine is uh, the first of my characters who's very inspired by me. And I realize how problematic that is. No, it's not. He, no, she killed someone. Oh. <laughs> like Austin, and he deserved it. I'm sitting here. He did. He, he, did. Deserved, he, did. Deserved, he absolutely deserved it. But she did kill someone, and that was something that actually Subba said to me early on when I was like, I'm a little worried because Selena is the most like me of any character I've ever written, and uh, I hope that's okay. She's like, I think it's fantastic. Also, she killed somebody. That's about us. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I'm like, my response is just like, it. It just makes you a good friend, really. <laughs> like, <laughs> a better friend. Like, oh. <laughs> No, who's gonna bury this body with me? You'll just be able to take my rings off. <laughs> there in five minutes. Yeah. All right, let's do this lightning round. Hit me. Okay, 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 okay. So, um, uh, oh, this is funny. I also will answer. What was your first kiss? Who was my first kiss? What you, you don't have to say who. What was your, what, what were the circumstances of your first kiss? <laughs> Uh, it's it so weird because quarantine, time is gone in quarantine. I feel like I tried to Instagram stalk him two weeks ago because I was like, what happened to him? <laughs> I think he's doing fine, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> I, I was trying to look for a place like where I could go kiss my like eighth grade boyfriend mm -hmm. and um, couldn't find anything. And of course, because I'm like a strange Hufflepuff, I really had tried to like organize this in advance. I was like, well, there's this option, that option. We can go on the elevator that only the teachers use because I did sprain my ankle. Um, and then I got caught by my history teacher. And this was really funny. He said, he pointed at my foot. And he was like, oh, do you have tendernitis? And I remember that like years later. Anyway, it was like in a courtyard. Can kind of I actually mispronounce it? Yeah, he's, we're from the South. It was funny. <laughs> Why do you do this to me? Okay, now you answer. It's funny. It's funny. I mean, you're welcome to do the same thing back at me. It's fine. Okay. Where was your first kiss? My first kiss was in college, my freshman year of college. A college? Yeah. 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 Well, okay. So, like, like, yeah. Sorry, I'm not shaming anyone. Though. Like, that's fine. No, I was not, not, not a kiss that was like, I, I don't know. Like a kiss at significant was college. Like it wasn't it was like because you know when you're in junior high, it's like you know, is that count? Is it, is that count? Is that? Do, do, do we count those? I don't know. I was just really nervous as I had braces when you read like all those stories about people <laughs> with braces getting stuck together and then your life just falling apart and someone has to like unfasten you from another human being. I would <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, I didn't have that worry. I was an angry Victorian goth in high school. <laughs> So uh, a lot of like, like a lot of people like I had like a, a like a velvet jacket I did I had a velvet jacket and I wore it when it was hot. <laughs> I met my I met my husband when I was like fifteen. So oh like, my God. I was just, that was my next question. Oh, tell me how you met your spouse. Why you always do this to us? You were out of the way. Story and it epitomizes you. <laughs> um, yeah, Renee was at our wedding. She fixed my veil because it was like falling off my head. She was like, you can't go, you can't go down an aisle like that. I'm like, help me. Um, so I heard about my future husband because he was building, his family was building a house in the neighborhood where I lived. And it's a really gossipy South Asian neighborhood. So I heard all about how smart he is, how like great his parents are, great family, blah, blah, blah. And you know, all of this was like pointed at me where they're just like, you're a terrible student and not nearly like this other kid who's moving in. So I thought he was going to be this massive nerd, but on the very first day of high school when I saw him, the sun was shining and the wind was blowing and he was so much more attractive than I thought he would be. So I ended up yelling, hey you, I know where you live, like really, really loudly at him. And he didn't talk to me for a year, but we carpooled like every day. I, and. and Friends who are tuning in, I asked her husband how he managed to avoid talking to Rashi because Rashi's chatty. <laughs> very, very chatty. And he said he just put him in headphones and walked away. 
It's a lie. Wait, Edward Cullen wasn't wrong. If you just keep sharing <laughs> where they live, it's, it'll work out. Anyway, next terrible question. My face feels red. <laughs> Jim, you've embarrassed me. Just <laughs> goodbye. goodbye. I'm still bringing my teeth. I hate you. All right, continue. What's your next question? Was that your first only question? Oh, no, 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 that's, uh, I mean, I have, I have other ones too. You know, like, um, yeah. You want to keep going or you, you want to ask one of yours? <sighs> I did want to ask, well, all my questions are exciting and interesting and like about yeah. the magical craft of your book and then you just okay. drag it down to junior well, high. Can fill the damn we can ask uh, magical but, questions later. That are no, I am curious about this. Who was your first fictional crush? Hmm. Oh, that's a good question. I know. I know who it is. Tarn Wanderer from uh, the Chronicles of Prydain. That's fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I fell in love with those books when I was a teenager. Um, well, actually, I was like 11 or 12. Yeah, I was a teenager. Is the 11 is still considered your right? Or are you officially a teenager at 13? 13, man. 11. Why? Like, let them have their childhood. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I feel like, so when I was 11, I was reading Artemis Bell for the first time. And that's when I realized my type. <laughs> oh, are you a cruel, sarcastic billionaire that's like looking for fairyland? I will probably try to propose to you. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first crush. And then when I met oh, you, no, you cried in front of me. No, I was, was going to embarrass myself, man. Why are you going to do this to me? Yeah, so I was Artemis Bell. I met him at Y'all Fest and Renee, I think you pushed me. You did something that like that like ruined me. I don't know, whatever. I like try to introduce myself in a normal way to be like, hi, I'm also a Disney author. It's not a big deal, but we're colleagues. But I started like, crying in front of him. But I didn't get a word out. I was there. It was, it was so cool. bad. Like, well, I didn't think you were gonna cry. I would not have forced you to do something. You were trembling like a leaf about to die. Like fall, like it was like on its like last leg. I mean, no, I was like, you should probably say something to him. No, I couldn't. And he then was I so he was so kind. He was he's so, so kind. funny and he's so nice. I'm just gonna cry again. He did. I like him. I called my husband to just be like, I met Owen Colford. He's amazing. He's like, who are you talking about? And then I was like, he's the guy who wrote Art of the Spell. And he was like, oh my God, tell him I love him. <laughs> like he was crying. It was a whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And what else I gonna ask you? Oh. If you could go to any other otherworldly land, where would it be and why? See, this is interesting because there's so many otherworldly lands that I love, but I don't actually want to go. Like, like I think of the world building in like Game of Thrones. No, I don't want to. I don't really want to be there. I, I'm not. That's not. That's not for me. Or some no. of that the the world of Ember. It's beautiful and expansive. I don't know that I necessarily want to be there because I die. I die. Um, I actually really think I would love to be in the world of the Gilded Wolves. Not so much the Silver Surface because it's cold. In the Silver <laughs> Surface. I don't, I don't do cold well. Even though it, it sounds really beautiful, Ooh. it's not for me. I mean, I, I like, like, I would like the idea of fur and like, like lipstick, but I feel like the fur would get like, like faux fur all the way. The faux fur would get like stuck in. You know, that is such a specific thing. And it's one of the reasons that I love about you. You're just like, well, I could wear the chinchilla, but it could ruin my lip gloss. Like, I kind of uh, like, it, it's, it's just, it's not a look for me. I, I, I prefer being comfortable. I like sunglasses very much, you know, like, so you know, that's my, that's my thing. I don't, so the world of Gilded Wolves, especially the word, world of uh, Lenin. I would really like that, so. I can totally see you there. <laughs> me, I would. I am like complimenting myself because of my my brief dabbling in the law when I was in law school. I was like, I could, I could totally sort of get past living in the world of like the cruel prince or the other worlds that we get to see in in the damned. I think I'm good at riddles. I like words. I could do it. You are good at riddles. I I I don't know that like. I think I could live in the world of the cruel prince or the world of the damned, the other world there. Um, I think I could live there if I were there. I think I could live there. Oh, there. yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't want to be like able to die. I'd be like, no, no, no. I don't need anything in these fey lands. I really like to eat. And I don't want to be one of these people who, yeah. like, silly humans who die on day one because they ate, you know, fairies. Mm -hmm. 
and I know, but like also, he, like, he gave me like a golden apple, and it smelled like the best. It's if it smelled like a like an edible Tom Ford perfume, and you said you'll die, I'll probably still eat it because I just have to know. I just really want them. <laughs> and this is a hubble bump right here. <laughs> I would Instagram live my final moments so that nobody else would have to do the same thing. I'll just be like, yeah, no, 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 we're, I'm not about that life. No, I'm, oh. I'm not about that life. <laughs> that's, that. too, uh, that's too gothic for words. I know, but, but I just really want to eat it. <laughs> so sad about this. Anyway, on that note, shall we transition to questions from the audience? I see that we have over 20. Woohoo! Yeah, okay. Hello. Hi. Hi again. Okay. So you guys ready for audience questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the first one is, why did you decide to write the damned in another perspective, and how do you think it adds to the story? Um, I think that uh, actually all of the books that I write have many perspectives running throughout. I think they average, even like the Wrath and the Dawn had, I think like five or six running POVs. Um, I just feel like it, it's, and I also write in third person past for the most part. It was the damn ambassador's character I wrote in first person present because I really like the immediacy of it. Um, and his POV, I think, is really integral to the experience of going from the mortal to now this immortal and watching sort of him lose his footing as to what he wants to be and who he wants to be in life. And one of the things that's said to him is what you are, um, it's it's it, it doesn't have any impact on who you become. It's only if you let it. So like like a character tells him, you know, you think that because you're now a vampire, you have this one set course that you're just gonna be dark and destructive and bloodthirsty. You're trying, there's a choice involved. Um, and I really wanted to explore that fully, and I felt that there, the only way to do that was to occupy his headspace and be present for the experiences as he felt. Like Rashi as well. Rashi's great with a uh, multi -tier. I wouldn't say I'm great, but I would say that I uh, eventually appreciate the struggle through them. Um, and one thing that I love that Renee does. Uh, with switching through those multiple POVs, they're very, very distinct. Um, I love that, especially in the dam, we have Celine in third person and Bastion in first person. And it's something that I, I did in A Crown of Wishes, and it lent a different sort of emotional urgency to both characters' paths. And I, mm -hmm. I feel like it's, it may seem like a strange choice to do, but it read seamlessly in the damned. And I hope it read seamlessly in a crown of wishes, but it is it's one of my favorite things to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the next question is how much does your first draft change from your final draft? And uh, this person said they're very interested in your writing process. Ooh. Oh, thank you. thank you so much. So I am, I've always sort of disliked the fodder like, versus <laughs> because Oh. <laughs> uh, the plotter versus the paper. Just I know the word cancer, I think, with like high school and like, you know, um, some kids at gym, beautifully. I like the uh, analogy of the architect or the gardener, and I think this is actually going by Gerard Martin. Um, the architect being somebody who has a scaffolding, who already knows what they want to build, and the gardener plants seeds and wants to grow. Uh, in that analogy, I'm much more of an architect. I uh, have everything plotted out well in advance. Sense of outline. You okay, hon? I'm fine. I think there's cat hair on my bat sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> Stop calling me out. Just let me see. I want to make sure that, like, I don't want to be that, like, really weird <laughs> person on this panel who's like, you're, you're like, falling apart, and I'm just continuing to talk about this. <laughs> no, I'm like, quietly dying. Just like, let me do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Continue. God. Okay, so, uh, my process. So I have extensive outlines. And uh, what was the first part of the question? Like, other than the writing parts, plus some of the answer. The first part was how much does your first draft change from final draft? So uh, my first drafts are fairly lean, and usually I have 
left off the ending. If my editor is watching this, she's probably cackling herself. I usually leave off the ending because halfway through the book, I don't like what I plan to do with the ending. And I want to punch it up more. And so then I consult uh, friends like Rocky and Saba about how to be really deliciously mean to my characters and then work that back into the ending. Uh, but I would say for the most part, my first drafts, they are just fleshed out much more by the end of the book. There's an explanation for why characters have done what they've done. Uh, the plot moves, I would hope, a little more seamlessly, a little with a little more of a, 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 a at a more clipping pace. Um, so it's difficult for me to actually say how much of them are the start because the the plot, the beats are there, but it's not as expanded and it doesn't make as much sense. I don't know. Is, is, is that a satire? I don't know. Is that a I think Rashi does this too, actually. Yeah, no, my, I just, well, your your drafts are lean, but they're still good. My drafts are like a steaming pile of adverbs and angst and nothing makes sense. There are no beats, we've just jumped to the ending. So yeah, I don't know. I'm a much better rewriter than I am a writer, I will say. Editing is one of my favorite parts of the writing process. Yeah. I think that uh, it, because for me, I really get to see uh, what works in a story. And when people will come in, my editor, when my beta is come in and they ask me the all important why, um, I'm really forced to explain myself. And often in explaining myself, I find either a better way or a clear path to getting to the same place, or I start to realize the place I'm trying to go to isn't organic and it doesn't work for the story. And maybe it's time to, to pivot. And I've, I've always really loved it. Yeah, same. <laughs> I think this next question really kind of ties in with this one a bit. It's from Megan Rodriguez and she asked, how do you know when it's time to stop researching, plotting or planning and start your first draft? So it's kind of good. Uh, okay, so for me, I give myself, before I begin a series, I give myself a deadline at which I have to stop researching because it's like, I'm a huge history buff and I love to research and I love to world the world. And if I don't tell myself, I, don't it, I will get really absorbed. Like, like with the rap that Don was joking about this was Seba yesterday at our event that I was like trying to learn about waste management, like, because I was just fascinated by every aspect of, of a uh, character's life and every aspect of the life that would exist in, in that world. You have to tell yourself, okay, I'm not going to do this anymore after one month. Because often what happens, you have this pile of research, and maybe 5 10% of it ever makes it in a book, but it, it shapes the world for you. It makes it real enough that you can feel confident navigating through this world. And I think that's what's really important for an author, to feel a sense of surety in place and time and setting uh, before you start to describe it to your reader. Because you, and from my perspective, I don't like the idea of building the world as I go because I feel like that's obvious, it's like piecemeal. And I don't get to really, I guess, like settle into the sensory details that I feel make for a really immersive read. I love that. I completely agree with that. I think it's important to know just enough. Um, there is a wonderful <laughs> in breaking the rules of time. And in terms of like, for example, zippers, I don't think were created until like World War One. They are still in the Gilded Wolves. Mm -hmm. I don't really care. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to enjoy myself. I lost three days of my life mm -hmm. on the sentence of he put ice in the champagne bucket. Because you know what? Ice was not a thing until like 18 years. <laughs> Who knew? Thanks to my dad, who sent me this whole article, and he was like, "Hey, kid, did you want to know about the history of ice?" I'm like, "No, I don't want to know." But now I do. Thank you, Frederick. It's the, world, it's the world you built, Dad. So it's okay. Yeah, truly. But it's all kinds of random stuff. Like, literally, there was this man who was just like he was hot. He was on a picnic. His lemonade tasted terrible, and it looked like warm urine. And he was like, "You know, it'd be really nice some ice." And like, and that's how everything changed. So uh, know just enough. And then allow yourself to be surprised, I think, with research. Because mm -hmm. if you do too much, you will find that you have given yourself more restraints to, st to, to let the story grow. You know, But I, I do completely agree with Renee. You, you should know a, a fair deal about 
if you're doing world building, especially with magic, you need to know the rules of that magic system before you start. Otherwise, uh, it's really obvious to everybody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Brittany asks, what does a typical day of writing look for you guys? <laughs> How we make those typical days of writing depend on <laughs> Uh, you know, I I wish we could. We could I, I don't know that Rashi and I could sell the illusions that we have uh, set standardized days. <laughs> Sometimes, if I'm in drafting mode, I'm working late at night, uh, and I have spent a lot of like the morning sort of daydreaming or getting into the headspace of a character, listening to music, watching a movie that I find particularly inspiring. All of these things that I do count as part of work. They're all they're obviously for my enjoyment because they're things I'm interested in, but I it's, I'm there with a purpose. Uh, so for me, I and, and that's changed also now that I have a child. I don't have that same uh, schedule, I don't have that same flexibility. The time I'm carving out some work, I really need to be efficient with it. Uh, so I, I don't know, there's no real standard day. I, I will say I don't like to have uh, more than two days to go by without me writing something. It doesn't have to be for a project that I'm working on. It doesn't have to be for anything on deadline. It's, it's to me, it's like exercising a little bit. Um, and I want to exercise that muscle. And also I want to, I, I guess, inspire myself a little bit too, just to keep everything moving in my head and to keep everything, because like if, if I don't get something that I'm thinking about on paper, even if it's just my thoughts, like that, and and I think that's really important now, especially when we're looking at a lot of negative negative negativity negativity in the world around us. To so sit down and get some of your thoughts out on paper, I find especially cathartic. Um, I'm somebody who suffers from anxiety. It's been an exercise that's helped me for many many years uh, because it's almost like just giving it a life means you can let it go. Like the fear, the worries that you have for that, that day, just looking at them and like, okay, so that's a thing. That's the thing that worried me. Now I need. Yeah. Um, I completely agree with that. Although I don't have a young child, I do have a cat. <laughs> I don't know. He doesn't do very much. Um, but our whole life revolves around him. I don't mm -hmm. know. I, I think like the the day to day thing for writing for me um, comes down to being able to silence the rest of the world outside. So I, I genuinely, Renee sometimes sends me text messages or emails at the weirdest time <laughs> of the day. It shocks me, like, why is she up at 3.23 a.m. and sending me this thing like, oh, hey, that's kid. That's what, that's what are you doing? Uh, but that's Renee. And I think like when she goes to sleep is when I wake up and <laughs> I, I wake up by making this motion, obviously. And I think it's really important for me at least to put my phone on airplane mode and to spend at least two hours completely undistracted and working on whatever it is that I have to work on. Um, and unfortunately, I have two major deadlines, both of which need to be answered by September. And so during stretches like these, that's when I have to wake up really, really early. I try to get most of my work done before noon. And then I spend the rest of the day doing admin stuff or putting my cat in the stroller and getting weird looks in the elevator. Uh, like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what projects are you guys currently working on? That's the next question. Um, well, I'm working on the next thing in the series. Uh, um, that is really, really fun. And it's also been challenging with everything going on around me. But I, I'm, I really function well in times of, of uh, I guess, adversity. I was talking about this with my husband. It's, it's, uh, I feel like like somebody has issued a challenge to me, and it's like challenge accepted, and that's what I'm trying to do. No, I, I'm serious. Like, it, it, the same I know. Thing. No, I believe you. That's why I'm <laughs> laughing. <laughs> and that's what, like, I, that's what I said about having kids too. Like, this is this is a challenge, and in these challenges, I feel that I experience the most growth, and I learn more about what I can and can't do. And that's liberating to a degree too. And then uh, having to write a book, having a child train, uh, this situation right now, I I feel challenged and it's a, it's a source of inspiration every day. That's wonderful. 
Um, I think it's really interesting that you're working on this book and it's like not in my inbox, just saying. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> um, it's not in a readable condition. There are certain scenes that, uh, if my editor's watching this, it's great, it's great. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not in readable condition, but uh, there are a couple of scenes that I have really enjoyed writing. I really love these characters. Um, uh, I actually feel like this, one of the main character of this book, there's a lot about her that I think inadvertently I, 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 I has been inspired a little bit by you. Oh. Yeah, she she like, <laughs> got a really quirky sense of humor, and I think it's a combination of you and someone else, like uh, my, 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 one of my other best friends, like like uh, Elaine. It's a quirky sense of humor. I I really I really dig it. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I have multiple jokes in my lifetime where I'm like mm -hmm. laughing by myself and I'm all alone. <laughs> yes. Supply more jokes for me and that'd be great. Thanks. Oh, yeah, you got it. Let me just tell you about my life the past three months. <laughs> um, what am I working on? I am working on book four in the Arusha and the End of Time series and also uh, the Gilded Wolves book three, which will be the last book in that trilogy. And... I hate everything, but I love these characters. It's a strange place to live in right now. Okay, the next question is, what author or book would you point to as most formative for you as an author? Oh gosh, so right now, because of what I'm writing and what I'm working on, I would have to say Anne Rice. Uh, Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles. I read them when I was 12 years old. Um, after being told that they were not appropriate for me to read, they didn't stick to me that. Fell in love with uh, these paranormal characters, fell in love with the world. And I. this was the time I also realized how much I wanted to try to write. At that point, I'd been a really avid reader, but I hadn't really considered, like, what would it look like if I, if I tried to write something truly? And this was the inspiration point for that. And uh, I wanted to write something like Anne Rice in the sense that it was hypnotic and completely transported. It was one of the first times where I really read it and lost all sense of time and what was going on now. I was completely lost in these books and I was like, I I want to do this. I love that. Her answers are so wise. Mine are just <laughs> when I was 12, I read Tide by Holly Black. Um, <laughs> Please tell me you've told this exact story to Holly. I told her once after many drinks. I didn't cry. <laughs> I didn't have like the hydration left in my body. <laughs> so it was fine. I love her. It's great. Anyway, the point is, is uh, so I was 12 and I read Tithe and it changed my whole life. It was the first time that I saw an other world that was depicted in a way that was both visceral and cruel and completely, totally believable. Um, mm -hmm. So when I was 12, I also like went into like a rain darkened wood looking for a wounded elf knight prince who I did not find or catch. What I did catch was bronchitis. And that was a sad week for <laughs> me. But um, the point being was that I wanted to make someone else get bronchitis. I wanted to make you feel as though a world and a character was just around the corner. Um, and that's what inspired me to write. I love both, all those books. Like, a lot. I read them at the same age, like, I don't know, 13, 14. Did you also wander into a rain darkened wood looking for Roybin? Not that no. I recall. <laughs> 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 um, Tithe is really special, I feel like. Totally. Yeah. Um, so the next one's really fun. It's what are some of you guys' all time favorite bookish couples? And Ashika says she loves you guys. Awesome. Love oh, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, oh gosh, bookish romance couples. Um, I'm trying to think. I might make people mad though. I I like. I know what Lee says about the Darkling, but I preferred Alina with the Darkling. Who said that? Not I. <laughs> In the background. <laughs> um, yeah, hugely problematic. Again, going back to the whole Byronic hero thing yeah. that I really have an issue. Um, I do love Cardin and Jude from Cruel Prince. I'm a big fan of Cardin and Jude. Uh, 
Let me think. Uh, also, I, I did prefer Bella with Edward. Um, I, I, I didn't. I, I didn't like Jacob. I didn't like Jacob. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> did you like Jacob? No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I to base with people. I'm like, why? No, I, I thought his POV is really funny though, and I liked that. Yeah, his POV is really funny for sure. It's it's it's, it's interesting. I think in books, I prefer Edward. In real life, I prefer Jacob because. I think one of the quintessential elements to a lasting uh, relationship, a romantic relationship, is laughter. It's necessary, and it, I find it, <laughs> I find it funny in an ironic way, especially with Khalid and Shazi. You know, he doesn't laugh, but there's like one scene that he laughs. And he laughs from the ears up. He never laughs. It was something like Victor actually pointed out to me. My husband, he's like, you know, he doesn't smile. He doesn't laugh. Why does everybody like him? And I'm like. <gasps> You're correct. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. Oh, with these characters that are really kind of, if you take a step back, I love Khalid so much. I love how tortured and wonderful he is. But you need to laugh in order to have he a laugh. He doesn't need to. He doesn't need to. He knows yeah. it leads to premature wrinkles. He just, he, needs to brood. Brood. he just needs to brood and continue being broken and beautiful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would have no problems with this. Um, favorite British couples. Well, speaking of problematic, I know. Uh, now, well, I am in the South. The time is wrong. The way that other main characters are portrayed is wrong. But I will never not love the banter between Scarlet and Red. I love oh, yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Rip away the time and everything else that feels like a story of survival and the way that he. I, I don't know. I just really. I don't know, but I was the. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Like, like I agree, and I think that that for me, like, it, it's it's interesting to do explore such problematic things from your past to yeah. really come to terms. Because for me, that was always about the romance between Red and Scarlet, and absolutely, it's so wrong to even just like focus on that and and let it be the, the main thing. And for me, Scarlet was also a, a uh, one of my favorite unlikable heroes. She's absolutely. Awesome. I like absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, I was still there for every step of the way, and uh, now we have to have these really just difficult discussions. And I actually love having these difficult discussions around books like *On the Wind*. I do too. I think that you you have to have those discussions, but it doesn't mean necessarily to throw something in the fire. I think that you can hold them both, or hold one maybe a little less, but. I do, whenever I stop by Oakland Cemetery in Atlanta, which is one of my favorite places to walk through, I do tend to visit Margaret Mitchell's grave. And I actually straight up ask her, I'm like, yo, like we gotta talk. I don't know how we're gonna talk, but you did this thing and I don't know what to do. Also, here's the seashell that I found. I hope you like it. And then I just leave it there. Mm -hmm. It's hugely problematic that you're romanticizing such a, a yeah. an awful period in our history. Um, like, yeah. like he, there was an interview that I read with her and I thought it was so telling that she didn't realize until she was like 12 years old that the South had lost. That's how much BS she had been fed as a small child. I mean, they're, they're fed this narrative of the beautiful South. And, yeah. and it's a whole thing. But anyway, we don't have time to dig into that. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, a, it's a great, and I, I, the discussions I've had with players about this, it's, it's yeah. Yeah. So we should be asking. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> So a new question, How, um, if you guys could write in any genre that you've never written before, what would you choose and why? Ooh. Oh, man. Uh, you know what, like maybe magical realism. I don't know how comfortable I would feel writing something completely contemporary and true to life. Uh, and there's, uh, like, I think people who do that are brilliant, and I think it's incredibly difficult. I need to have at least a sprinkle of magic or the possibility of magic in anything that I write. Um, so maybe that, that will be a challenge to, have, to write a contemporary book that has nothing to do with magic or mystery or history or lore or anything like that. It's just, yeah, that would be interesting. I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I, what's that? Ignore that sound. Um, <laughs> I think that I would like to write a thriller. I think I'm writing one, but I don't really know what it is. It's so like in the strange amniotic stage of a book. Um, but it would be really wonderful to have a craft 
to be able to pull it off. Um, some of my favorite books and authors, uh, some of my favorite authors write thrillers. I really, really love Tana French's book, mm -hmm. The Double mm -hmm. Murder Squad. Um, mm -hmm. I love that she turns what is essentially a character going around and asking a question and asking another question, another question, into something that is uh, riveting and exposes something about human nature. So mm -hmm. maybe one day. Okay, we have a second question from Chica too that I like. It's, um, I love both the Star Touched and Wrath in the Duck worlds. Is there any chance of returning? Also, would those characters be friends as you both are now? <laughs> really, they would be friends. I think that they, they would be aspects of them that would, you know, like again, Colleen not smiling, that would be probably very irritating to, um, I, I think it's Dory from uh, Crown of Wishes would be very annoyed by the fact that Colleen doesn't smile. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I never say never about going back to those books. Never say never. I, I fell in love with uh, that book. I, I can't speak for Rosh, but you know, never say never. Yeah, I love that. Um, I there's there's this book that was published called Star Touch Stories, which has like this sort of e even a, a little bit of an epilogue to A Crown of Wishes, um, and it mentions Gowrie's granddaughter, and it's just an it's just the tiniest window that's open just a little bit that maybe one day I could return to. But I I still don't even know what I would say about her or what her journey would look like. But I don't know. I'm not done with that world, I'll say. Yay. Okay, so I think this will be our last question, but um, this has been amazing. <laughs> so much. But so the question is, um, are there any favorite quarantine, quarantine time reads? That you'd recommend? Oh uh, well, I just started reading uh, Sarah McLean's *Daring in the Duke*. Sarah McLean is one of my favorite uh, historical romance authors. I love her, and this is—I remember I talked about uh, this book with her back when we could all still hang out. But I was in New York uh, the last time she was there for *The Watch of the Beautiful*, and it, it's still sort of surreal. It's so cool that I get to like talk to these writers whose work I've admired for such a long time and really talk about craft. She was actually talking about Daring in the Duke, and she's talking about how it's like a grovel novel. Like, and, uh, yeah. he, and she was like, really? She was just like, ah, oh, I, I, I don't know. I, I knew what I was doing when I set myself up for this, but like, I'm now, I'm now, I'm in it, and I'm like, what can I do? And she pulled this off. What? Wow, just slow clap. She pulled this off. Um, Southern Spear recommended a couple of books to me. Um, uh, one with a really long title that I forgot. It's about something about like time, how to win the time. Maybe it's how to win the time war. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. One, right, yeah, 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 right. That's a book I really want to read. Um, what are you reading, Rosh? What do I have been reading? Um, I've been reading a bunch of nonfiction, actually. Uh, the one that stands out to me the most is Adrian Mayer's uh, nonfiction or biography of Mithridates, who was this Greco-Persian. King, most famous for the word Mithridatism, which is when you ingest a certain amount of a toxin to immunize yourself from poisons. And um, I love it. I don't know. It's like somehow became book research for a thing that will, I, I don't know. I love that. Uh, I'm in the middle of Salvage the Bones right now by Jasmine Ward, which is fantastic. I finally read Stamp by Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Oh, and I'm yeah. sending it to like, all my family, which has been great. And The Damned is literally my favorite read of summer, truly. And I'm also on a reread of City of Brass by Shannon Chakraborty. And the last book in her series just came out. It's wonderful. Honestly, if you read the Beautiful, The Damned, reread The Wrath and the Dawn, and reread City of Brass, you would feel like like that sort of like, I'm just so tired and jet lagged from traveling kind of wonderful. Uh, That's yeah, how yeah. all the books will make you feel. Thank you. Well, thank you guys so much for thank joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Rosh. Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate you guys joining us. We have lots of virtual events coming up this month. You can find out about them on our website, social channels, or by signing up for our e-newsletter. Um, again, thank you, Renee, so much for partnering with us. And Absolutely. Thank you. The rest of your tour is wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you. Take Bye care. Guys. Thanks so much for joining. Bye. <laughs>